after the Revolutionary War, there was no proclamation line of 1763 anymore across the top of the Appalachian Mountains. So there was nothing keeping settlers from moving across the mountains and into the land they called the West. And back then, just like today, we kind of look at the West as being a land of opportunity. They looked at this West as a land of opportunity because Ohio was about as far West as you could ever dream of going. Um, why was this a land of opportunity? They knew there was good farming land here. They knew there were rivers. They knew there was plenty of water. They knew it was a place where a person could make a living. Like we discussed earlier, um, this part of the country was given to the United States in the Treaty of Paris with Britain. The difference is the British never left. They gave this part of the country to the Americans and the Native Americans, but they did not actually leave. So there were British forts all over what was called the Ohio Territory. Um, and the British were providing a number of native nations in this part of the world with weapons and supplies to resist the oncoming American migrants because the Native Americans quite justifiably saw this as their homeland and saw the Americans coming over as invaders into their homeland. All of this came to a head in our area in the Battle of Fallen Timbers. It was just one of hundreds of places that these new Americans pushed into in the lands of Native Americans, destroying one way of life and creating a new way of life. I'm standing today at the monument at the Battle of Fallen Timbers down in Maumee. When I grew up, this is where they brought us as school children to say, this is where the Battle of Fallen Timbers happened. But it didn't exactly happen that way. And if you wanna find out how and why, join me today as we discuss movement in the early Republic. So let's talk a minute about this word migration. To migrate means to move, and it's the root for words like immigration. Immigration with an I is people coming in, and migration with an E is people uh, exiting. Okay, so you emigrate from a place, you immigrate to a place. When we talk about migrations of any kind, we think about push and pull factors. Um, push factors are those that push a person out of their homeland. Something stinks in the place you live, and it's pushing you out of one place. Pull factors are the things that attract you to another place. So, um, when I think about, like, in my family, uh, my grandfather, during the Depression, my grandpa grew up outside of Pittsburgh, um, and my grandpa couldn't find a job anywhere except Cleveland. So, joblessness pushed him out of greater Pittsburgh, and then jobs in, in the um, steel industry in Cleveland pulled my grandfather to Cleveland. Um, in my lifetime, I had a job I hated in Indiana. Um, I love the people I worked with, but I really didn't like some of the stuff I was doing. So I got pushed out by a job I didn't like. I got attracted to Toledo by a job I liked more. Um, and you've all heard of somebody moving because of a girl or moving because of a guy. That's, that's a pull factor. That's causing you to migrate. So when we're talking about migration in the early republic, we're looking for the reasons that people leave their home country and come to the United States or leave the eastern part of the United States to come across the mountains, across that treaty line again, into the land that will become Ohio. So what is pushing people out of the East Coast? Well, the typical push factors that we talk about in a social studies class are gonna be things like poverty, discrimination, autocracy, those are things that are going to drive somebody out of Europe and into the United States. But what's going to drive people from the East Coast to the interior, poverty is going to be part of it, okay? Because land starts getting expensive. You guys understand that Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, those are tiny states and the soil is pretty rocky. It's hard to grow things out there. So if you were a farmer, first of all, there wasn't much land, which makes it expensive. Second of all, land wasn't that good compared to what we have over here. So there, there were compelling economic reasons to leave the East Coast and come to the interior. Land was cheaper, land was easier to farm, um, and the idea was you're going to get out from kind of the coastal elites. So those are some of the things pushing. It's, it's this lack of land, expensive land, pushing people out of the East, and this idea that the West is a land of opportunity, pulling them to Ohio, then Indiana, Michigan, and so on and so forth around the Great Lakes. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, we're going to come back to these push and pull factors every time we talk about immigration, emigration, and migration in the United States. So 
after the American Revolution, we've talked about the proclamation line of 1763 uh, approximately 1 million billion times in here. We talk about the proclamation line all the time because it's really important. Remember, that was the line after the French and Indian War that goes over the top of the ridge of the Appalachian Mountains. And the proclamation line was the British saying, don't go there, don't go over that, don't go over that thing. And now the proclamation line is no more. Remember, that's that's one of the things kind of motivating the colonists to break away from Mother England. Um, so the proclamation line is gone, and now they're allowed to come over the mountains, and they do. American migrants flood east over the Appalachians, and Kentucky becomes a state, Tennessee becomes a state, and eventually Ohio is going to become a state too. Now, we viewed that as a migration over the mountains. Native American nations, as you can well imagine, looked at this as an invasion, just like you and I would. Okay, we would say, oh, those people are coming in there, they're coming in our country, and we didn't invite them, and then it feels like we're being invaded. And Native Americans felt like this was an invasion by these American settlers trying to steal their land and take their way of life and quite possibly kill them off. At first, the U.S. government, like we talked about in the, uh, in the video about like Washington's presidency setting precedent, um, Washington's government enters into treaty with the Native American nations as real nations. The problem is, as we said before, the American government, the U.S. government, is perfectly willing to abrogate these treaties. They're perfectly willing to break these promises. Now, why, why are the Native Americans looking for promises? They're hoping to limit white settlement. They're like, okay, okay, we can't stop them from coming entirely, but maybe if we give them this much, we can keep all the rest for ourselves. And they tried that, and it didn't work obviously, right? That's that's the nature of this thing. The U.S. settlers just keep pushing west and further and further into the territories that the Native Americans were supposed to have themselves. Um, so the Native Americans fight back. They form a confederation that, that we a lot of times simply call the confederation, which should not be ever mixed up with the confederacy, which comes in the Civil War. But the Confederation that's put together here, the Native Confederation, um, is a bunch of different Native nations in today's Western PA, Ohio, Northern Kentucky, Southern Michigan, Indiana. It's a whole bunch of different Native nations from basically around where we live. Um, the Wyandotte, who live just east of town, e east of the city of Toledo. Uh, the Shawnee, the Miami, um, they're the big factors in this. They're the nations that are the biggest nations in the Confederation. Uh, but you also have the Delaware, sometimes called the Lenape people, the Ottawa people, the Potawatomi, the Kickapoo, the Kaskaskia, and the Wabash peoples are all part of this. And the British are going to provide support. The British aren't looking to go to war yet, but they are willing to support people who are fighting against the American settlers. And that British support is going to be critical in the next phase of this story. So the American response to the formation of the Native Alliance is military. Um, in 1790, President Washington sends a general named Josiah Harmar to lead a force toward an Indian, uh, basically capital city called Kikianga. And Kikianga was at the confluence of what are today called the St. Mary and St. Joseph Rivers that form the Maumee River. And if you know a little bit about our geography, that's Fort Wayne. They go towards today's Fort Wayne. Um, Harmer's men get their tails kicked up one side of the street and back down the other. Three separate engagements, they get just whooped by the Native Confederation and Harmer's men retreat. A year later, Washington says, all right, we're going to do this again. And he sends a general named Arthur St. Clair who ends up being a really important figure in Ohio history a little bit later. St. Clair gets sent to, you go and do what Harmar couldn't. And St. Clair's, yes, sir, I'm on my way. So St. Clair's guys come basically over through Pittsburgh, down the Ohio River, up through what's today Cincinnati, and start working their way through western Ohio. Um, they don't even make it halfway up the state of Ohio before they get beaten even worse than Harmar's guys did. 97% of St. Clair's force is defeated in this battle. St. Clair's defeat is one of the worst defeats in United States Army history as percentage of force as casualties. 
This is absolutely devastating. So they begin some negotiations. The United States and the Confederacy begin some negotiations. But as the diplomatic negotiations are going on, Washington is also preparing for a war. So he authorizes the formation of what they're going to call the Legion of the United States. And the Legion is going to be all professional soldiers, all trained up by Anthony Wayne over the course of a year. Okay, so in 93, going into 94, Wayne is training this very large, for the time, force uh, organized into sub-legions. Uh, and they will sail, again, basically from Pittsburgh down the Ohio River towards Cincinnati, start marching up, and that brings us home. So, obviously, all of us know the name Fallen Timbers because of the mall, if nothing else. Um, but let's talk about the battle that happened here and happened here, not where the monument was in the beginning of the film. Uh, prior to 1792, American forces had lost two grievous battles against the Native American Alliance. Um, those forces in the multinational alliance of Native Americans came from the Ottawa uh, Confederacy, the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Miami, and the Wyandotte nations. Um, President Washington appointed a general from Pennsylvania, Mad Anthony Wayne, to command this new force called the Legion of the United States to try to succeed where these other American forces had failed. Um, Wayne's forces worked their way down the Ohio River to near Cincinnati and then worked their way up from Cincinnati towards a place called Fort Recovery that's kind of southeast of Lima near the, near the uh, Indiana border. Um, the British were pretty sure that Wayne's forces were going to advance north from there along what's today the Auglaize River up towards what is today Defiance, up the Maumee River, and then what the British really feared was then Wayne's forces were going to head up towards Detroit, which was their major uh, military installation. So to stop them from moving as fast on Detroit, the British ordered the construction of a new fort called Fort Miamis. And Fort Miamis is in today's Maumee. If you guys know where downtown Maumee is, and you go towards Toledo on River Road by a couple miles, there's just this set of hills that don't make any sense next to the river, and that's where Fort Miamis was located. Um, Wayne sees Fort Miamis as a threat and decides to move towards it. He's not gonna go away from it. He's gonna go towards Fort Miamis. So they march up from Defiance, past today's Napoleon, past today's Grand Rapids, through today's Waterville, and they're coming towards Fort Miamis. Now. Um, the Native Alliance captured one of Wayne's scouts, and this dude sang like a bird. He did not understand the meaning of the word, shut up to save your buddies. And he tells the Native Alliance how many guys are coming, where they're coming, and when they're coming. So now the Natives know exactly where the attack is going to be. The British up at Fort Miamis tell this Native American Alliance, they're like, oh say old chaps, Perhaps now that you know where and when they're coming, you could pick the time and date of your battle. You can pick where the battle's going to be. And the natives decide to pick here. So over here, in the, in the middle of a low wooded area that had been hit by a recent storm, there were blown over trees, hence fallen timbers. Um, and it provided Native American soldiers with cover to ambush Wayne's Legion. As you can imagine, you can hide pretty well behind trees like that. Um, a lot of future famous people were here. Tecumseh, who was a Shawnee leader who became critically important in the War of 1812, was a young warrior here. William Henry Harrison, a future president of the United States in general, was one of Wayne's top aides here. Uh, William Clark of the Lewis and Clark Expedition was here as a young lieutenant. Um, and 10 years later, of course, uh, William Clark becomes uh, very famous exploring the West with Meriwether Lewis. The battle that was fought here raged for hours with terrible losses for both sides. Uh, eventually, the Native Alliance broke away and the Americans advanced to the gates of Fort Miamis up by Maumee. While they never did take the fort from the British, they did break the Native Alliance. And over the course of the next year, nearly all the Native nations signed the Treaty of Greenville. So as you learn there about the Battle of Fallen Timbers, it's a decisive victory for the Americans. It breaks the Confederacy. The Confederacy finds that the British are not willing to go that extra mile to help them, and the Confederacy comes to the negotiating table. Um, the Treaty of Greenville is signed, as you learned in the video, 
it gives away almost all of Ohio, parts of Michigan, parts of Indiana to the United States. And then that area from Cleveland over through Toledo and the Toledo suburbs going over to the Michigan and Indiana boundaries today um, is given to the Native Americans. They get to keep the part of America that we live in. Well, newsflash, we live here. So I think you can imagine how that turned out. Now, there were two really important leaders. There were many uh, important leaders, but one of the most important leaders here was a native, native leader named Little Turtle. Um, and Little Turtle was from Kikionga. He was from Fort Wayne. Um, Little Turtle, after the Treaty of Greenville, really urges everyone. We need peace. We need to ratchet the tensions down. We really need to just kind of rebuild our lives in this part of the world that's been given to us. There is a younger leader there, Tecumseh. People call him Tecumseh a lot of the time, but my understanding is the correct pronunciation is Tecumseh. And Tecumseh is young and he's angry. And he says, this fight's only the beginning. You old men like Little Turtle, you let us down and we're going to make a comeback. And that, my friends, is a little bit of foreshadowing that'll get us to the War of 1812 uh, a little less than 20 years after this. Thanks for watching today. And here's kind of a little final word about all of it. The Treaty of Greenville, as you guys can see here, reserved Native American sovereignty over Northwest Ohio. So Toledo is up here. The battle is down here. And you can see that black dotted line. Everything up and to the left of that line remained Native American territory. The rest of it became territory uh, for the settlers. And the U.S. government made payments uh, for the land that was taken from the Native nations in the southern and eastern parts of Ohio. But of course, we're all here, so we know that treaty didn't last. Uh, between 1795 and 1812, American settlers push into that area that was remaining for Native American territory. And in the War of 1812, just everything changes in our little corner of America. And we'll talk about that later.